You see, to worship is not about living a life that's guarded and defensive, taking a stand that is my way or the highway. To worship is totally surrendering to the will, the word, and the way of the Lord, where God reveals his glory and his greatness that's on display through our lives. You see, when we recognize how great God is, then we'll see how sinful we are. When we recognize how faithful God is, we have to confess how faithless we are. When we recognize how compassionate, how caring God is, we recognize how cold and how hard our hearts are. When we recognize how forgiving God is, we're able to see how unforgiving, how we hold grudges and how we hold people in prison for the rest of their lives. Come on everybody, put your hands together. It's got to get better. All over the world, listen to these words. People come. People come. People go. People go. Your life has been, Your life has been out, of control. out of control. You're confused. You're confused. But don't worry. Don't worry your soul. It will get better. It's got to get better. really directs the worship team on this morning with that one. Amen. 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 Now it's time for the word of the Lord. Let's make room for the word to reside in our hearts that we might not sin against the Lord. And so we're going to come from that great book of Mark chapter number 11 verses 15 through 17. And it reads, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And all of God's people said, amen. And when you're going to make room for the Lord in your life, in your heart, it lines right up with this morning's message. And this morning's message is, it's time to serve eviction notice because there's some things in our lives it's got to go. Some things in our lives, it got to go. There's a story of a great friend of mine. He had an auntie who was 83 years old. And she got diagnosed with cancer. The doctor was giving her some options. And some of those options was, he said, I can remove some of the cancer, which would be less risky for you. Or I can remove all of the cancer, which will be more risky. The 83-year-old auntie immediately responded to the doctor. And she said, doctor, anything that even resembles or looks like cancer cut it out of me because if you leave it in me I'm going to die anyway I believe this morning anything or anyone that's not contributing to the value of our life it needs to be quarantined out of our life not for 14 days but for the rest of our lives this text this morning it takes place during passion week or the last week of Jesus earthly journal because it's time for sin to go from the hearts of humanity. Jesus is on the road that would eventually lead to Calvary's cross, where he would sacrifice his life to provide the provision for our eternal life, to get rid of sin. On this road leading to Calvary's cross, we find a different Jesus. We find a Jesus that's a little upset. And some say he wasn't a little, he was a lot. He's no longer calm, he's no longer cool, he's no longer collective. He's no longer that compassionate Christ. Now he's in your face, Christ. What happened to the patient Christ? That now he's impatient. 
What happened was his father's house was being misused, not according to God's purpose. Jesus' journey is interrupted by his observation that there's a long line to get into the temple. For all of the Gentiles, due to all of the commercial activity in the precinct, it wasn't just one little church, it's like a big church convention. In the precinct where the annual Passover festival was taking place. These long lines was not due to the temple being a place of compassion. It was not due to the temple being a place of caring. It was not due to the temple being a place of giving. But in the text, it reveals that the temple was a little corrupt. Yes, corruption was taking place, not in the local tavern, but in the local tavern temple, where people's lives that should have been transformed by the presence of God, their lives were being tarnished by those who wore holy clothes, those who had holy titles and holy positions, but were operating with hearts of thieves to steal your joy and to minimize you being in the presence of God Almighty. It was Passover festival time where people came together to celebrate what had happened in Exodus when God was about to destroy all the firstborn in Egypt except for the children of Israel as they experienced the grace of God when he passed over their homes because he saw the blood that they had put on the doorposts. However, here Jesus noticed that the temple was no longer the place of worship unto God, but had now been changed to a place of worship unto greed as the local priests were taking advantage of the innocent people that were coming to be blessed by God, but found themselves almost bankrupt by those who were representing God in the temple. Instead of getting closer to God, the people were coming for the festival. They found themselves on the brink of becoming destitute, bankrupt by those who were misusing, mishandling, and missing the opportunity <coughs> to serve as God's vessels for drawing people closer and closer to God. Instead of drawing them closer to God, they were distancing them. They were making it more difficult and creating within these Gentiles a little distrust. You see, the temple would not allow for any type of currency from pagans with their pictures on top of on their coins. Because individuals, when they came to the temple, they had to pay a temple tax. And they had to exchange their local currency for the temple currency. And that's why they had money changers that served as the local currency exchange. So the money changers at the temple they took advantage of these individuals that were trying to get closer to God. They would manipulate and inflate the temple's currency so that those that were visiting, they could only use their money for so much. Why? Because they inflated the currency where their local currency had little value. That was the problem with the money changes. Secondly, the people were traveling from a long distance. And when traveling from a long distance, they did not want to have to struggle and bring their unblemished animals that they were sacrificing in the temple from over long as 100 miles. So what would they do? Rather than struggle and bring their cattle, they would purchase their sacrificial animals once they arrived at the temple. Once again, those who were in charge, they were taking advantage of the people. Temple allowed the greed within them to raise the prices of their cattle. So here we see greed within them to put profits before people by inflating prices and inflating the currency. Therefore, what ended up happening? Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. He didn't say he just loved the Jews. He didn't say he just loved the Gentiles. He didn't say he just loved the rich, the poor, the hungry. He said he so loved the world 
So now instead of them breaking down barriers, they're presenting a barrier to keep the Gentiles out of the temple. The Gentiles were trying to get into the temple for worship, but they left the temple worse than when they came. Why? Because the people were inflating the currency and inflating the cost of the cattle. My good brothers and my sisters, this is what happens when we, my good brothers and sisters, when we confuse our worship of God with the worship of greed. You see, when we worship God, it's not about us. But when we worship greed, it's all about us. The Jews were making it harder to allow the Gentiles to have access to the temple where they could pray and worship. The Jews wanted to keep the blessings all to themselves and stop the Gentiles from entering the temples. The priests were insensitive, impatient, inconsiderate to those who were in need for assistance by justifying it that they were coming up with the inflated currency and the inflated prices on the cattle, saying, I'm just blessed by God. No, we're not just blessed by God. When we're taking advantage of people, also we can pad our pockets and build up our bank accounts and live in bigger houses. That's not blessed by God. That's becoming less like God when we take advantage of other people. It appears in the text that the, peer, the priests were worshipers of greed more so than of God. You see, there's two things about worship. Worship is both, both what we do and worship is who we are. You see, who we are, it precedes what we do. To be a worshiper is to surrender, to submit, and to sacrifice your life to God. Surrender, submit, sacrifice. It does not say justify why what we do. It does not say negotiate why what we do. It does not say consider. It says submit, surrender. It says give up and yield to God Almighty. Why is that? Because we, he is worth it based upon who God is and his character. You see, when we recognize the character of God of being omniscient, who knows all, omnipotent, who is all-powerful, omnipresent, he's everywhere at all times, then this will lead us to recognize his worth. And it leads us to the word in the New Testament for worship, proskonia. Pros means towards. Kaneo means to kiss. It means to bend down to somebody who we recognize is above us. As such, to worship is to have a proper perspective of ourselves when we compare it to God Almighty. It's not thinking less of yourselves, but it's thinking less about yourself. You see, to worship is not about living a life that's guarded and defensive, taking a stand that is my way or the highway. To worship is totally surrendering to the will, the word, and the way of the Lord where God reveals his glory and his greatness that's on display through our lives. You see, when we recognize how great God is, then we'll see how sinful we are. When we recognize how faithful God is, we have to confess how faithless we are. When we recognize how compassionate, how caring God is, we recognize how cold and how hard our hearts are. When we recognize how forgiving God is, we're able to see how unforgiving, how we hold grudges and how we hold people in prison for the rest of their lives, all because we're unwilling to forgive others. When we recognize how giving God is, we're able to see how selfish we are. When we recognize how mighty, how awesome God is, we recognize how little, how least, and how lost we are, how we have missed the mark when we think we're all that. We come to the truth and to the reality of how undeserving we are to be in the presence of such a great, gracious, and a giving God that we serve. When we come to this reality, this is what makes us bow down because we recognize how much we've missed the mark 
we can't even lift our heads up because we recognize the guilt and the shame that I bring before our God. Yes, this is when we are set free, my brothers and sisters. Not to be bitter, not to be blamed. But when we worship, we are blessed because we still belong to the God who still has grace and mercy for our lives. You see, the priests did not have this type of worship. The priests had become comfortable in their corruption where they were justifying their wrongdoing all in the name of worship. The priests had a false sense of reality when they were standing before God. You see, the priests were just like some of us, like me sometimes. We supersize our spirituality and think we're better than other people all because we can quote a couple of scriptures. We overestimate our character and our conduct just because we haven't done anything out front. Or not even just because we haven't done it. We've done it and we haven't got caught. They had miscalculated their behavior as being blessed when in fact they were being a burden to people. So the, the priests, they were bending, bending towards valuing financial gain more than spiritual gain. But when, why were they bending? They were bending because they were not trusting God's grace was sufficient to meet their needs of both Jews and Gentiles. Is this not our problem in America today? Slogans, make America great again. When did America stop being great? Is this not our problem in America today? All the Karens in the grocery store have no regards for anybody else around them. Is this our problem today in America? We have the righteous right Get rid of Obamacare. Everyone does not deserve a quality health care. Is this our problem in America? We have the conservative majority. Get rid of welfare. Don't take my money to feed the hungry. Get rid of mental health facilities from those who can't help themselves. We want to block others from receiving their blessings all because we're selfish, all because we are concerned about me, myself, and I. That is nothing but worshiping yourself. You see, whenever we do not trust God to meet our needs in life, that positions us to go over the cliff where we are never satisfied. We're never content. There's never enough. All because we don't trust God to meet our needs. Therefore, we will hurt whoever comes in our way to take our blessings away. But on the flip side of that, when we are trusting God to meet all our needs, we're not bending with worry, but we're bending up being so thankful that God will bless us and sustain us and provide for us and make a way out of no way. That's when you worship God, not to take advantage of people, but to depend on God to always provide for us. So for each of us this morning, don't begin, don't bend as my brother when he was praying this morning. Don't be bend because you are carrying all the stresses of life that you were not made to carry. Living in worry, have you in a position where you're about to break down and have a nervous breakdown. Don't bend in that direction. Bend in worship because you are unloading the cares of life because the Bible says cast all your cares upon him because he can handle your stress. He can handle your debt. He can handle your health issues. He can handle your marriage problems. He can handle your children problems. He can handle your anxiety. He can handle whatever you're going through, but you got to be willing to bend down and unload it onto the one that says, give it to me try me trust me see if I won't bless you can I get an amen trusting God to take care of every need so we don't break down but we break out into a praise so these priests instead of influencing the people instead of inspiring the people to have a positive impact upon their lives they were infecting the people with greed of the world in the house of God so Jesus is no longer the patient savior. He's no longer the parable teaching savior. Now we see the Jesus who is radical, the Jesus who is relentless. And excuse my French, but we see the Jesus who came in there and raised some hell for those who were disrupting his house from being a house of prayer. 
Jesus comes in demanding, saying, it's got to go out of my father's house. He said, not tomorrow, not next year, not next week, not next month. He said, it's got to go right now. You see, Jesus does not want his believers to be deceived by living a worthless worship of things, people, and places. Jesus wanted his disciples, he wants you and me to be devoted to worship that's not based on what we can see, but based upon what the scriptures tells us. They that worship the Lord must worship him in spirit and truth. Worship him in compassion. Worship him in patience. Worship him in forgiveness. Worship him in kindness and generosity. Worship him in long suffering. Worship him in perseverance. Worship him in the truth that I am my brothers and my sisters keepers. Worship in the truth that I am a burden barrier for those who are less fortunate. Worship in the truth I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Worship in the truth that I gotta keep my mind on things above and not things below. As Philippians 4 and 8 tells us, whatever things are right, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are admirable, if they are excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. You see, the temple was never supposed to be a place of trading and buying and selling. The temple was supposed to, was created to be a meeting place, a dwelling place, a healing place, a place for entering into the presence of God Almighty. So why would the priests make it so difficult and so demanding for the people to get into the temple? They forgot three things. They forgot whose house it is, they forgot the house rules, and they forgot the house standards. Jesus quotes here in Mark, he takes an Old Testament passage and he quotes it from Isaiah 56 and 7. And when he says this, he's not focused, it's his father's house. Not a physical building that symbolizes the spiritual reality of God's presence. He says in Isaiah 56 and 7, these things I bring to my holy mountain and I give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. But my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. All nations, not just the Jewish, all nations. He says a house of prayer place of communing with God, a place of hearing God's still voice, a place when God has your undivided attention as they sung today, a place where we move out all the distractions, all of the noise so that we can hear directly from heaven. And then not only did Jesus quote from Isaiah, but he also he quotes when he says he's going to turn my place into a den of robbers. With Jesus quoting that from Jeremiah 7, 9 and 11. And that reads, Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods that you have known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, We are safe, safe to do all these deceptive things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching you, declares the Lord. What does this tell me? Before there was an ADT watching over your house, the Lord is always watching over our spiritual houses. We can never hide from the Lord, even when we're trying to do our little secret scenes. God is always watching over each of us. So Jesus lets the priest know. He knows their current behavior. As he quotes from the Old Testament, that's like a den of robbers. So what is Jesus basically saying to you and I today? Basically, he's telling the priests and he's telling you and I today that you and I, we cannot live double lives. You see, you can't have on the priestly outfit but have a pimp's attitude. You can't call yourself a Christian but you have the intentions of being a corrupt hustler. You can only walk on one side of the fence because if you stay on the fence, you're gonna destroy that which is supposed to be a gift to you. You cannot live a double life. As this picture says, if I walk with the world, I can't walk with God. 
So each of us must make a decision. Who are we going to walk with? We can't swear like a sailor in the backyard and sing like a saint in the choir. We can't be mean like a pit bull at home and sweet as a dove on the church pew. We can't be angry like a lion at work and act like an angel in the ministry at church. God does not want closet saints. They're not allowed in the house of the Lord. God has told me to tell somebody, tell myself, if the world can be liberal and tell the world, come out of your closets, God wants each of us, the Lord desires for us to be liberated saints, to come out of our closets of living a double and trifling life living holy for 90 minutes on Sunday, but living like hell for the rest of the week. Mean at home, attitude at home, not speaking to each other, striking down each other, withholding forgiveness, unwilling to work together, living in bondage. We cannot live like double dipping saints double dipping saints I dip in the church house and I dip in the club I dip a little bit over here and I dip a little bit over there God says either you're going to be with me or you're not going to be with me can I get a little amen there See, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we don't have the church building right now. So the church is really in trouble because the saints are dipping a little bit everywhere. I'm dipping in this church and I'm dipping in that church. I'm dipping over here and I'm dipping everywhere. God says, I don't need no dipping saints. I need dedicated. I need devoted. I need divinely inspired saints that's going to give me 2,000% to serve me, worship me, and give Give me everything that you got to give. Can I get an amen? amen? See, there's only one behavior that's allowed in God's house. And that's holiness. First Peter tells us in 14 through 16, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you as holy, you be holy. Holiness, holy, hagias, the Greek word, is to be unlike, is to be different, is to be otherness, is to be dedicated, not into the same. Dwight L. Moody had a quote that says, a holy life will produce a deepest impression. A holy life becomes like a lighthouse that blows no horn. They only shine. You see, when we are living as Christ wants us to live, we don't have to toot our horns. We don't have to brag because our light will shine before others. So there are some things that don't belong in our lives, my brothers and sisters. There are some things that don't belong in the Father's house. This morning, it's all about they got to go. Yes, we all want to tell President Trump to get out of Chicago because he does not belong here. He's been unconstitutional. Well, President Trump may be being unconstitutional, but are we guilty of being unchristian or unchristlike, of misusing, mishandling, and missed the opportunity of our personal temples, of being a lifeline and being the individuals that attract others unto Christ? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. These priests were not lifting up God, but they were lifting up the prices of the currency to misuse and to mishandle others. Jesus confronted them. He called them out and he corrected them with a cord of correction. It's got to go. What's in your life this morning, my brothers and sisters? They're stopping you, they're stopping me from being a prophet, the preacher, the priest, the teacher, the servant, the husband, the wife, the mother, the father, the child, the professional that's drawing others to Christ. What's got to go in your life? Where are we robbing God's glory from our life? It's got to go. What's in your closet? What's in your trunk? What's in your glove box? What's in your purse? What's in your wallet? What's in your email account? What's in your mind that has to go? There's some things we just got to get rid of, of the unnecessary stuff in our life so we can discover that we have everything we need. You see, for many of us, we have to stop hitting the replay button in our lives. We play the same bad behavior. We have to graduate from hitting replay to upgrading our lives with a, to refresh our minds from the old 
so we can entertain them. So what am I saying? Stop replaying, stop rewinding the old and the outdated so we can start refreshing, renewing, relaunching the new mission of God in our lives. We have to stop having flashbacks of past hurt, past sins, past failures, and past disappointments. We have to stop dreaming about nothing and doing nothing. We have to stop living in fantasy land. We have to stop flirting with temptation of fire in our mind that will eventually have our behind on fire. This morning, each of us must ask ourselves, have I been misusing? Have I been mishandling? Have I been missed the opportunity? All of us got to repent and say, Lord, forgive me where I've gone wrong. And so Jesus gives us three things, and I'll be out of your way this morning. I promise you. First, Jesus says, some things you just got to drive out of your life. Or oh, reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple, of course, began driving out those who are buying and selling. You see, some things are not going to pack their own bags and leave your life. Some things are people you have to drive out. Jesus, you the poor to drive them out. But you and I don't need a poor. We need the light of Christ to shine in us and through us that we'll drive out the darkness of our life. Jesus, you the poor, but you and I don't need a poor. We need the courage of Christ to drive out the corruption in our society, to drive out the truth over the lies, to drive out with anointing the haters and the attackers in our lives. Jesus, you the poor, but you and I need the passion of Christ to push out all the dead weight, press out or pull out or pour out anything that pollutes our life. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, some things we have to drive it out. But not only do we have to drive it out, the next thing says he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Jesus flipped the tables of the money changers that were overcharging the people. So the next thing Jesus tells us, not only must you drive it out, some things you want to have to just flip over. You see, Jesus flipped the table, there was no discussion, there was no conference call, there was no Zoom meeting, there was no HR performance plan. Jesus just flipped it on his face and did not allow that behavior to continue. You see, every time a thought comes into our mind, sometimes we just got to flip it with a scripture. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So when life gets hard and the enemy tries to drop a seed of doubt, you got to flip it and say that he has begun a good work shall complete it. When we have the wrong desire, we got to flip it and say, one thing I've desired of the Lord, that which I will seek. When we're in the wrong places in life, like the valley of depression, the valley of death, we have to tell it out and flip it with Psalm 23. Yea, though I go to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. My good brothers and my good sisters, here in the text, that which was being inflating the currency that made the Gentiles feel even more inferior because they were deceived to believe that what they had was not enough. They increased the value of currency to decrease the buying power of the Gentiles. Is that not what the enemy does to us? He comes to each of us. He wants to inflate his power in our life, over our life, and for your life, and devalue the power of God to sustain our life. But this morning is flipping time. Not flipping houses, but flipping anything and every thought that makes us devalue who we are or whose we are. We got to flip it because you are not used up because God has great things in store for you. You got to flip it because you're not a past tense, you are present tense, you are future tense because God has great things in store for you. You got to flip it because you are not born for trouble, you're just passing through trouble. You got to flip it not to doubt God but to depend on God. You got to flip it, don't hate others, help others. You got to flip it, don't be intimidated but influence others. Don't run from your problems. Face your problems. Say, so, hey, baby, I gotta flip it. So some things you gotta drive. Some things you gotta flip over. And the last thing Jesus tells us is some things you just gotta block out. You see, there are some things and some people that you just gonna have to block from your life. And Mark 11, 16 says, Jesus would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. You see, we have to block anything or anyone that's not trying to cancel culture, 
but are trying to cancel Christ from being the center of our life. If it's our attitude, we got to block it. If it's our anger, we got to block it. If it's our pride, we have to block it. If it's our intelligence, we have to block it. If it's our competitiveness, social media, our career, our hard heart, we have to block it. If it's jealousy, we have to block it. We have to block it before it blocks us from being in the presence of God Almighty. So there's things in our life that we are total control. We have to drive it out. We have to flip it. And we have to block it. So basically what Jesus did in this particular scenario, Jesus had to shut it down so that he could shout it out. As he said in Mark 11 and 17, as he talked them, he said, it is it not written that my house shall be called the house of prayer. And so as we close this morning, my brothers and sisters, each of us must ask ourselves what has to go so that our lives represent a life of prayer, a life of dependence, a life where God is truly in the glory through us. What is it that we're being challenged that we have to take action on? In this world that we live in, we are God's instruments, but we have to speak truth to the power. We have to be his instruments where racism has to go. We have to be his instrument where poverty has to go. We have to be his instruments where inequality has to go, inequity, injustice. We have to be his instruments, personal instruments, where we have to drive out laziness. We have to drive out judgmental. We have to drive out being arrogant. We have to drive out being procrastinating, complacent. We have to drive out all of these behaviors that does not lift up God and that does not do anything to help us. My brothers and my sisters, if we ever want to have a community without crime, it's up to us. We have to drive out black on black crime. We have to drive out babies killing babies. We have to drive out carjacks. We have to drive out domestic violence. We have to drive out mean marriages. We have to drive out loose living. We have to drive out disobedient children. You and I have to drive it out. Jesus has given us the power. He's given us the authority. Well, we have to take a stand like he took a stand when he saw that injustice was taking place in his father's house. My good brothers and my sisters, remember this. We have to drive it out. We have to flip it. And we have to block it out. It has to go. And I leave you with this last scripture. And it comes from Ephesians 5, 3 and 7. And it says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because all these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, no impure, no greedy person, such a person as an idolatry, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you of any words, for because of such things God's wrath will come on those who are disobedient. And our last verse, therefore, do not be partners with them. May God bless you and may He keep you. Do not be partners with anything that blocks God from being the center and the head of your life. It has to go to make room that there's nothing the holiness in your life. There may be some